Welcome to today's webinar, Exciting New Features in OpenEdge 11.5. Today, presenting will be Rob Strait and Roy Ellis here at Progress Software. I'm your host, Marla Spurs, for today's session. So let me introduce our panelists today. Rob Strait is Senior Manager, OpenEdge Product Management at Progress Software Corporation. He is responsible for requirements gathering from the OpenEdge user community and for defining releases to satisfy those requirements, primarily in the areas of development, application servers, mobile, and business process management. Rob has been with the Open Edge Business Unit since 2005, with 25 years of development experience initially as a software engineer and later as a product manager. Roy Ellis is joining us, and he is a principal software engineer with the Open Edge development team. Having spent his first three years in tech support, his next 16 years have been spent in the development of WebSpeed, App Server, Name Server, Admin Server, Open Edge Management, TDE, Arcade, and most recently, the Pacific Application Server for Open Edge. Colleen Smith was going to be joining us today, however, with the blizzard conditions that did affect the Boston area for the last few days. She will be listening to the morning and evening sessions and addressing any of the questions that came through. We will be posting that very shortly after this webinar. And with that, I would like to hand today's presentation over to Rob. All right. Thank you very much, Marlis. And uh, so we're going to be talking about uh, you know, the latest and greatest features and capabilities that have been delivered with OpenEdge 11.5. This was really kind of a holiday celebration or a New Year's gift to our user community. Uh, we, did, we delivered right at the end of uh, December 2014, and we're officially kind of kicking it off today uh, with this particular webinar. Uh, so we're very excited about the fact that we've uh, produced this release, and we'd like to walk you through you know, the key new capabilities and features uh, that we've been able to deliver. And before I kind of get into the details, we always like to position, you know, why, why is this important? And, and really, to be honest, any time we put out a significant release like this, um, you know, clearly it's important to kind of keep track of kind of the new innovations that are being delivered to you. But I think at a higher level, from a business perspective, you know, it, it's always a good idea to try to keep up with releases. And it doesn't mean that you'll adopt every single release. I know that that's not practical for, for many of you. Um, but you know, if if you are an ISV creating applications and reselling them in the marketplace, uh, we continue to innovate and, and provide you with features that will help you be as competitive as possible. Now that might be uh, you know better performance, it might be lower total cost of ownership, it may be new features and capabilities that make your offering to the market more attractive to your end users. If you're using uh, Open Edge for applications to run your IT business. Uh, certainly, you know, being on maintenance and paying maintenance dollars, you know, gives you the right and the privilege to take advantage of the new features that we provide in our new releases. And we always want to encourage you to take a look at that. You're investing in progress, uh, and and you know, certainly with uh, an element of that is the support you can receive from progress. But another key component is, you know, all the fixes that are getting done, all the new features and capabilities that you can take advantage of. Uh, so you, you really do want to, you know, be keeping up with uh, changes in the technology as they happen over time. And as you know, Progress works very hard to make sure that we're kind of uh, leading that charge. We try to be a little bit ahead of the curve as, as te technologies evolve and change. And of course, we like to deliver a capability to you that makes those technologies easy to adopt. In the end, you know, you've got users of your application, business requirements are continuously changing. Uh, again, every time we put out a new release, there's new capabilities that will help you stay current with that. And then a smaller detail, but important nonetheless, uh, you know, we do continue to certify new operating systems and new platforms. Uh, we've done a lot of work over the last, oh, I don't know, eight plus years as far as, you know, supporting the transition to a 64-bit processing world. Um, and, and I know some of you out there listening maybe are on older technologies and have not been able to take advantage of that. Again, these are all things that you know, would, would encourage you to, to look at the newer technologies and to uh, schedule in when you can start to move forward. And I threw in the increased stability that I, I think you have to remember that every time we put out a release, 
all the features that have been in there from previous releases just get more and more stable. You know, bugs get reported over time, we get them fixed. Uh, so the stability overall the product does increase. And you might say, well, geez, what about the new features? They're new, so they can't be as stable. And you're absolutely right. If, if you take advantage of new features and capabilities that have just been released, um, there is a possibility that they could be less stable than some of the other features that have been around for a while. And, and you can, and you will, <laughs> make your own decisions around when it's appropriate to take advantage of the new technologies. And then finally, of course, there's some new capabilities, features, and functions that we're going to talk about in this presentation. You're probably aware that you know we put out our 11.4 release in uh, August of 2014, and we're now talking about our December release in, in 2014, uh, a fairly short development and release cycle. Over the last uh, several years, uh, we've kind of increased our rate of producing releases, uh, sometimes two times a year. There was a case when we had actually three in one year. Uh, and, and we get some feedback from customers, and it's interesting how it, it can be different depending on who you're talking to. Uh, some customers tell us, you know, just keep those features coming as quickly as you can get them out. If they're done, then I want them delivered. And, and it doesn't necessarily mean that everyone's going to just jump right on them and start using them, but they want to have that as an option. So, uh, so, so there's a whole school of thought of just new features, get them out to me as quickly as possible. There's the other school of thought, and we hear a lot of feedback about this, is, uh, hey, Progress, what are you doing to us? Too many releases, I can't keep up. Uh, and, and, and then it really comes down to, oh, and by the way, uh, the release that I've got in production deployment right now is ending, it's nearing its end of life, and I'm not in a position to do upgrades quite yet. The, the interval or duration has been too short. So we've uh, tried to address that with some modifications to our open life lifecycle policy. So just as a reminder, and this particular chart has not changed in a number of years, uh, we deal with our life cycle in, in three phases. Uh, when we have a new release, like our 11.5 release in December, that becomes our currently active release. The previous release, which was 11.4, immediately becomes mature. And then finally, at some point in the future, uh, that mature version gets retired. Uh, so this particular chart, and I'm not going to go through all the details, just simply gives you a snapshot of what you can expect for each of the life cycle phases. Clearly, if it's an active release, we're doing a lot of things like uh, uh, adding new features potentially, we are correcting problems and putting out service packs uh, for high priority issues that can't wait for a service pack, we'll do hot fixes and so on and so forth. Uh, when you get into the mature phase, we tend to back down a little bit. We're not enhancing mature products, but we certainly are fixing bugs and problems uh, and so on. And then eventually products get retired and, and ultimately then that's just a, a supported version. But we're certainly not putting in new enhancements and we're not typically fixing bugs, although there are some options to get bugs fixed even in a retired phase. So again, that has not changed, but I wanted to set the context for the three phases, active, mature, and retired. So what have we done with the policy? So again, we, we, we found that uh, with feedback from many of you out there, uh, you know, you were on releases, maybe 11.2 or 11.3, uh, that you were finding were nearing the, the time when they would move into the retired phase and you had them in production, and, and the period of time from when you started working with it to the time when we were going to get ready to make it retire was very short, and that's a problem, and we understand that. We've, we've listened to you, and we've made some changes to our policy. So we, uh, effective January 1st of this year, 2015, um, we've, we've modified the policy to say that the duration of time moving from the active phase to the mature phase will now last a minimum of four years for any major release. So when we went to 11.0, the previous 10.x release would be uh, in the mature phase for, well, the actual mature duration would be at least four years. And then for point releases, like our 11.5 release and other point releases, uh, we would guarantee they would be in the active, the, the duration from the active to the mature phase would be a minimum of three years. So we've extended this significantly. Um, it, the, the former policy basically said, uh, you know, you go to mature as soon as the next version releases, and then it's in the mature status for just a single year. So you can see we've, we've significantly extended this duration. Now, we continue to, to do hot fixes and entertain service packs, which are just roll-ups of basically bug fixes uh, during this duration. So when you're in the mature phase, we're still fixing bugs. Uh, 
I, I just want to note that uh, any time a bug is reported, of course, it's at the discretion of progress whether we will actually address it or not. Uh, some things are very important, and of course, we'll fix them. Some things maybe are less important and might get deferred. And then uh, finally, when we do reach the retired phase, based on this new policy, we do allow for uh, the ability for you all to request a hotfix in the first year of the retired phase. And that hotfix, should we at Progress decide to accept doing it, um, that would actually incur a fee. We would charge you for that. But it, again, it gives you an opportunity and an option to uh, get you know, important fixes and repairs done even in the first year of the retired phase. So you can see this now significantly extends your ability to have full support from progress, uh, things getting fixed as appropriate, and uh, should give you more confidence as you deploy your products or your applications out into the uh, user communities uh, that uh, you won't find they're going to be retired six months later or 12 months later. You've, you've got a fairly large window here to, uh, to uh, have these products available. Now here's the uh, kind of the summary. The things in red are, are what has changed from the old policy to the new policy. And this just simply reflects all the things I've told you. So 11.5 became active uh, last month, December of 2014. We don't know when it's going to become mature because we have not announced when the next release of Open Edge will be. But the earliest we would retire it would be three years after it became active. So that would be December of 17. Uh, if we look at, for instance, go down to Open Edge 11.2, 11.2 under the old policy was actually retired. We were taking it out of retirement. And now the earliest retirement date, again, would be the three years from when it became active. So that would be February of 16. Now, we don't know exactly when it's going to be retired because it could be February of 16 or sometime later. So when we do retire it, we will then note when the date was that it was retired. Now, this particular chart and information about the life cycle policy can be found on Progress Communities. Um, we do have a product availability guide that documents this. Uh, we do document this particular chart that I'm showing you at the bottom here on that page as well. And there will be details uh, posted shortly as far as all the, all the nuances of what the new policy means and how it all works. All right, so that's the lifecycle policy. Let's move right on into what the 11.5 features are. So at the very high level, you know, the, the kind of themes of this particular release uh, were what's shown here. Um, we really wanted to focus on scalability and management of ABL applications. And the translation here is we wanted to look at the application server technology and see what we could do to improve it. And, and those improvements uh, come in a, a number of forms, and we're going to get into a number of details. Uh, but moving to more of a standards-based infrastructure versus the uh, proprietary infrastructure we have with the current OpenEdge app server. Uh, Implementing a, an app server that is multi-session so we can make significant improvements in how resources are utilized and ultimately then lowering your total cost of ownership. Um, I do want to make it very clear that uh, this new app server technology is an alternative or an option to you. It doesn't uh, force the current OpenEdge app, app server to be moved into the retired phase. Um, we are going to be maintaining and supporting two app servers for the foreseeable future. But you have to remember that the OpenEdge app server was first created quite a while ago, two decades ago. Uh, and it was built on old technology, and a lot of things have changed. And we wanted to, to, to improve that. Um, it does make use of what we have here, Progress, is a common Pacific app server technology that many other product groups are using. We'll talk more about that. Um, and it certainly can be used uh, you know, with OpenEdge. Uh, it can be used in multi-product deployments. So if you're using OpenEdge with perhaps Rollbase or Corticon, they all use the same app server technology. The next big theme was around table partitioning. Now, table partitioning was something that we introduced in uh, August of 2014 in our 11.4 release. Um, and as a brief reminder, it simply allows you to take your database tables and to segment them into smaller chunks, right? And, and you can do that. By, uh, in a variety of ways, and, and you have full control how, how, how you would define that. Um, the simple exa simplest example is uh, partitioning by calendar year. So perhaps you're recording transactions for a calendar year, and maybe now in 2015 you want to take all the 2014 transactions and keep them in their own partition. 
Now, why would you do that? There are performance implications, and, and over time, there are implications around managing that data long term. So for instance, uh, your 2014 data eventually will become read-only, most likely. And if you set that partition to read-only, you can take your last backup, and you never have to back it up again. So there's a lot of good things around that. So we, we rolled that out in August 2014. There are a few additional features we thought were, would be very important as you move that technology into a production environment with your application. Uh, I've listed a few here. We'll talk a little bit, a bit more about that in a few minutes. And then we've introduced a new database offering, and I'm going to spend a minute on that as well. And then, of course, uh, there is a, a laundry list of new features and capabilities, and we'll touch on some of the key ones in a moment. So I want to talk about our new Advanced Enterprise Edition database. So we've introduced a new database offering. So you're all familiar with the fact that we've had the Enterprise database, the Workgroup database, and the Personal database. This would be a fourth offering. And, and why have we created this? We wanted to create an offering that had significantly more value above and beyond what you get in the current Enterprise database. And part of this is based on feedback we've been receiving from all of you that we have some really great add-ons to our database. Uh, and you see the list down on the right. Uh, things like transparent data encryption, security has been a, a big issue over the last number of years. Uh, Multi-tenancy has been a very important uh, feature we've, we've added to the database. And it's you know, kind of cousin table partitioning, uh, replication, open edge management. So all these features are available as optional add-ons to an enterprise database. And, and what we find in the feedback we get is, you know, we love a lot of these features. We have to go through a lot of trouble internally in our companies to justify the spend on these. So we have to go in and do a business analysis and justify the purchase of, of any one of these. And if we want a second one, we have to go through that process again. And it gets kind of cumbersome. So, so we've basically packaged together all of the add-ons with the enterprise database. And then we've, we've offered it out at very attractive pricing. So you know, when you talk to your account managers about this, you'll see that we have significantly discounted uh, the Advanced Enterprise Edition database uh, over the Enterprise database plus all of the add-ons. So, so there's a, a, a nice price uh, differential here. It makes it more attractive from an affordability perspective. We've also done some things around making it easy to install. So we deal with this as a package. It's not indi individual components, although you have the full capability to specify which, which add-ons you want to use at any given point in time. You're, of course, not forced to use them all. You use the ones you think are important to you. So uh, there's a lot of convenience here. And again, uh, it's uh, total cost of ownership gets reduced. Uh, I would strongly encourage you to take a look at this uh, if you see that there are add-ons that you're interested in, but you haven't been able to justify them uh, to date. Uh, the last thing I'll mention is that uh, you know, your existing database licenses, your existing add-on database licenses, all can be traded in to, towards the purchase of advanced enterprise addition licenses. And uh, I think most people are, are fairly aware of our trade-in policy. Uh, it's fairly generous and fairly unique in the, in the industry. Um, we give you full credit for whatever you paid for your, your previous licenses towards the purchase of these new licenses. So, uh, we've protected the value in, in, in your you know, commitment to using our products. All right, so that's the Advanced Enterprise Edition. Again, you know, certainly speak with your account manager if you'd like more information uh, on the details and, and how you can take advantage of this. All right, and as we kind of drill not down into 11.5 and some of the key features, I, I always like to start out by saying that I'm, I've listed here you know, a handful of, of key features if you looked at the new and revised features document, which is available to anyone on Progress Communities, uh, you'll see a list of, I'm going to guess, 30 or 40 different enhancements in this release, as we do with all of our releases. Some of them are a little bit smaller and maybe you know, targeted to a smaller subset of users. Some, and, and many listed here, are, are really targeted towards the broader audience. So let's take them one at a time. We'll briefly talk about these. So the table partitioning features I alluded to earlier, we, we had some features that we thought would be very important once you had developed with table partitioning and were ready to get into a production deployment environment. So being able to set your partitions as read-only or refer back to read-write, being able to rename partitions, view them, dump them, <coughs> excuse me, 
to do index activate and deactivate by partition, to do index and table checks by partition. So all these kinds of features, um, you know, certainly you can see that they would be particularly useful once you're in a production deployment environment and you're maintaining your partitions for your end users. The Open Edge GUI uh, is technology that we've had for a number of years, uh, you know, and many have made use of it. Uh, we, we've had a number of requests for uh, feature enhancements uh, to make some of the controls a little bit more easier to use or more functional and cap capable, so we've gone ahead and made those improvements. Uh, we've had a lot of feedback that uh, you would really like more flexibility in how you install our products onto your systems. Uh, so some of that has to do with, you know, can I get, say, uh, multiple instances of OpenEdge installed on a single system? And, and, and related to that, then, is can I mix and match some of the 32-bit capability with a 64-bit installation, uh, particularly some of the client technology? So we've made enhancements and improvements there. Uh, to, to make that a little bit easier, and so you can have more flexibility in the, uh, the bitness of the components that you would like to install on a single machine. And I'll mention there's more work to be done here, and we are entertaining uh, some additional improvements to uh, really kind of try to further simplify the overall installation process. Uh, the next one is ABL Doc. I think many people are familiar with the concept of Java Doc, and this is very similar. Uh, you know, from your procedure files, your include files, and so on. Uh, we can go through and generate uh, HTML-based documentation to document the APIs of, of your application. So uh, very useful. Uh, it saves you from having to kind of manually construct those documents. Our OpenEdge BPM offering is something we've had on, on the market for a number of years. Uh, a lot of customers are making use of it and giving us feedback. Uh, we've selected some of the key items that, that have been mentioned for them as, as higher in priority. Uh, as we find more and more of our customer base taking advantage of our role-based offering uh, and having that interoperate with their open edge applications, uh, we wanted to make sure that uh, from your role-based user interface it was uh, easy, well, possible and easy, uh, to make use of uh, business process management or business processes that are defined and implemented for open edge. So we've tied that together with an adapter for role-based. We found that the uh, email adapter uh, is useful for many of our customers, but if you deal with uh, end users who are speaking different languages, uh, human languages, uh, you would like to tailor your emails to the language of choice for that particular customer. So we've made some enhancements to the email adapter to support that. And finally, from an overall uh, high availability perspective, um, the server itself, JBoss, and this is the enterprise edition, uh, does support clustering, and, and we've made some modifications to take advantage of that. So again, for those who want to make sure the systems are up, up and running and highly available. The next item is the uh, custom media types for REST calls. So um, I think people are, are aware that uh, we've done quite a lot to support uh, the REST standard, uh, the, the basic standard of calling things uh, over HTTP. And uh, we can expose, of course, uh, open edge uh, ABL code as uh, a REST service. So we, we had uh, requests for people saying, um, you know, when I deliver my payload over a REST call, there are times when the format of that payload is only known to me. And I have uh, basically a custom application that knows how to interpret the data that's being sent. So this just gives you the flexibility of defining uh, basically custom apps that know what to do with the data that's being transmitted uh, in the REST calls. The call external REST services. So again, we do support already exposing ABL business logic uh, as REST services. So people calling from the outside or uh, across within the uh, open edge environment, uh, we do support REST. Uh, with 11.5, we do now support also calling out to external REST, REST services. Excuse me. Uh, I've got a little asterisk here in, uh, on the next one as well because uh, uh, we ran into a situation where this is uh, feature complete and, and we believe is, is working as expected, but we did not have the resources or time to complete our QA testing. So we did want to make it available so people could start making use of it. Um, we've continued our testing and uh, should there be any issues that we find that need correction, uh, our intention would be to 
correct those in the first service pack, out of 11.5, uh, just coming in a couple of months. But in the meantime, it seems uh, stable and people are making use of it. Uh, very similarly for the uh, web speed users, um, we have a strategy of ultimately um, migrating our web speed uh, users to be able to use the new Pacific app server. Uh, so uh, the first step along that with that process is to support uh, the execution of um, CGI, which is a part of the web speed, and uh, have that operate with a Pacific app server. Now again, that is supported. Uh, we do believe it is working, but we're continuing our testing because we were unable to complete that testing in the time available to us. And again, should there be any issues that we need to resolve uh, with this particular feature, that would be resolved in the first service back again in, in the next couple of months. And finally, I, I'd say the last, uh, the, kind of the biggest one for last, and we're going to get into a little bit more detail with Roy in a, a moment here, is the Pacific Application Server for OpenEdge. So the, so the Pacific Application Server for OpenEdge, which sometimes we refer to as the PaaS for OpenEdge, um, is really then a next generation app server. And you know, for those who are familiar with and have used the OpenEdge app server in the past, um, we've worked to integrate uh, a number of the features and functions and capabilities into a, a single offering. So it, it does have its own embedded web server, which is Tomcat. Uh, it has the features of the OpenEdge app server as far as being able to run business logic and that sort of thing. And it also has uh, the notion of what are currently the OpenEdge app server adapters uh, to interface with and talk to different technologies, all bundled into a single package. Now, as I mentioned earlier, this is all layered on top of and makes use of the Progress Pacific Application Server, the PaaS. Uh, PaaS platform is the basic generic platform that all of our technologies make use of here at Progress. So as of today, OpenEdge, RollBase, and Corticon all make use of and run on top of our Pacific Application Server. And uh, there are tailorings required for OpenEdge so that it can interpret and understand how to execute the ABL business logic. Hence, it's the Pacific app server for OpenEdge is the superset. So there's a common server that can be installed. There's common administration, common configuration. Um, that's good just not just for OpenEdge, but for uh, a number of these pro progress products that you may be using uh, together. Um, we've implemented a multi-session agent. We're going to talk more details about that. It runs in the single process. Uh, the notion here is that we really want to do, you know, minimize the amount of resources that are uh, utilized when running this new app server. So the number of operating system processes is reduced, resources hence are reduced. Um, there is some resource sharing. And I'll give an example of DB connections across multiple sessions. And again, I just want to reiterate this new offering doesn't mean the uh, current OpenEdge app server is being deprecated or discontinued. Quite the contrary, we, we are going to continue uh, uh, enhancing and supporting the OpenEdge app server for the foreseeable future in addition to the new Pacific app server for OpenEdge. And, and as I mentioned earlier on, we do have a very generous uh, trade-in policy to allow you to take your current app server licenses and trade them in uh, towards the purchase of licenses for the new Pacific app server for OpenEdge. Okay, so with that, I'd, we'd like to get into just a few more, more technical details around what this new Pacific app server for OpenEdge is. And with that, I'd like to turn this over to Roy Ellis. Roy? Thank you, Rob. Again, I'm Roy Ellis. I've been with Progress going on 20 years now. Um, I was part of the team that brought you the version 9 app server, WebSpeed admin server. And I'm very excited about the uh, Pacific app server for OpenEdge um, because it's a huge departure and a great improvement um, over the old infrastructure. So what is the Pacific Application Server? Well, I got this right off the uh, web page because uh, I couldn't say it any better. But basically, it is an enterprise class web application server. And what does that mean? Well, it means it can run in a single instance, just like a small uh, application now, but it can also fully scale to a cloud environment hosting multiple applications in a multi-tenant environment, both cloud, um, intranet, um, and hybrid. Um, it was designed so that it was easy to develop and deploy. And it simplifies that task by creating and deploying and operating business applications in a standard web application fashion. Okay, when I say designed for the internet and the internet, what do I mean? Well, it is a web application for easy deployment, but built into it is, is a Tomcat web server and all the tools you need to handle that. 
again, it is highly scalable, not only from the Tomcat uh, perspective or the web application uh, perspective, but also using the new multi-session agent, which we'll get into in detail. Again, the web application packaging makes deployment, upgrade, and scaling much easier. You can deploy to different platforms across different internets, and um, using our Tomcat, you can just integrate it very quickly. Uh, lastly, it was designed with production in mind. We have two products. We have the production product, and we have the development product. The production product was, was designed with the, the insecurity of the Internet built in, so we have Spring Security built into this product. Um, all you have to do is use that. We also have permission um, uh, security set in the production product. Again, this will get you about 90% of the way you need to be there to have a secure application um, in the cloud or on the Internet. Okay, so we know we can do production, but what about development? It is designed to be used in the Progress Developer Studio, and the development instance is automatically installed when you install the 64-bit Progress Developer Studio. So our development instance is already installed, just like our other uh, app servers and web speed brokers, and is automatically configured. Uh, now, if you install the 32-bit Progress Developer Studio, you wouldn't get the 64-bit paths because Paths for OpenEdge is only 64-bit. However, you can get a free license for a 64-bit platform of your choice, a developer license, to allow you to use it. Like I said before, the, the OpenEdge uh, Paths is already integrated into Developer Studio. You'll see it in your list of servers. You can stop it. You can start it. You can publish to it. All of those things are built in automatically. You can also create deployments of it to be used somewhere else. You can also use the Progress Developer Studio to take an old REST or SOAP or mobile application and deploy it so it can be used with the new paths. Again, we work very hard on in integrating with the Developer Studio to make it easy for you to use the new uh, paths for OpenEdge. Lastly, uh, for development, the development product has no security, so all the security is disabled, so you can get up and running right away, and also all the management tools are built in so that if you have any problems, you can debug them as quickly as possible. So as we talk about development, What's the first thing that comes to mind when we're moving to a new product? Well, what in my code do I have to change? And I'd love to tell you you don't have to change anything, but the truth is you'll probably have to make small changes to get your application to work with the new Pacific App Server. The first thing I need to say is since this is a web application, everybody will have to connect via the web, HTTP. So all of your connect values will have to change to dash URL, and they'll have to do an HTTP. So that's the first thing. The second thing is that our new product comes with two sessions, stateful and state-free. So the session model of uh, session managed uh, would, would, um, would match our stateless, and our session-free would obviously match our state-free in the old classic. However, what if you want to do state reset or state aware? Those can be handled by uh, modifying your connect, disconnect, or your activate and deactivate procedures. So if you wanted to have state reset, you put a quit in your deactivate or disconnect, and if you wanted to have a session that was bound in the state aware mode, you just use the session bound. Again, small amounts of changes that don't affect your whole application, just in those specific things that uh, either handle connection or disconnect. Uh, the last thing you need to understand, this is probably the hardest, um, just to get your head around, is that in the classic app server, each agent was its own session, so you would configure everything for an agent. In the new app server, the multi-session agent, which we'll get right to, um, has sessions. So when you configure your properties, you're going to have to think more in a session mode than in an agent mode. Um, so it's just something to think about, and it takes a little bit of uh, time to get your head around it, but after that, you'll be up and running. We actually ran a uh, workshop at Exchange where in three hours we help customers move a current application from the classic to the Pacific app server, and some of them had them up and running in three hours, and most said they would have it up and running in a day. So that's the type of effort it's going to take. A little bit, but I don't think a lot. So let's talk about the multi-session agent. I call this a special sauce of the new Pacific app server. Um, it can handle hundreds of concurrent requests. I repeat, hundreds of concurrent requests. Um, I was asked how many agents, multi-session agents you think someone should run, and my answer is one. You should only need one. Uh, we've tested with 200 and 300 concurrent requests. We have a test that was designed to build a PETA-sized database, and I ran hundreds of these requests interactively. Um, so I have no problem saying that the multi-session agent is very robust in that way. 
The other thing I already said is the multi-session agent can handle both the session managed and the session free requests at the same time. So you don't need to run a different app server broker for each type of state. You can just run one broker and one agent to handle all of those. Um, of course, one agent uses less resources than the same number of classic app server agents, so uh, less memory for sure, less CPU also, and context switching. Uh, lastly, I'd like to say the multi-session agent is very, very fast. Uh, if you're just running and testing at transactions per second, as I was doing with an ATM test, uh, with the same number of classic app server agents, I could get seven times the number of transactions through your database. Now, that's if you're, if you're measuring with transactions, right? Okay, so we've talked about the infrastructure and we've talked about the multi-session agent. Let's take a hypothetical here and do a, a comparison. Um, if you have an uh, application right now that's out there running and it's doing anything with the web, you have to install Tomcat, and then you have to install our three different adapters, the AIA, the WSA, and the REST mobile. You'll see that in the orange cloud. Then you'd also have to run an admin server to handle everything, and if you're running all these things, a name server to handle which broker to go to. Then you would have three different broker processes. And if each broker process had 50 agents, you would have 50 agents. So you'd have a lot of processes out there and a lot of things to manage and a lot of CPU and memory being used. With the new path for OpenEdge, the components are very s simple. You have Tomcat, which already has all the adapters built in, and already has a session manager, which did a lot of the work of the old U broker. Okay, that's one process. That's, that's your front end. And you have one multi-session agent that can handle 150 ABL sessions at the same time. I think this is very powerful. It makes configuration easy. It makes management easy. It makes monitoring easy. And it gives you more bang for your buck on a smaller machine. OK, so let's talk about high performance. You get higher performance with this and lower system resources. Again, we have fewer supporting processes, as Rob has already mentioned. And the last um, diagram just showed we use less CPU and less memory. Um, the multi-session agent is very fast at transactions in the database, and it also uses less memory. Uh, we have tests here. We use ATM. Uh, many of you probably know about it and used it. It, uh, it mimics an automatic teller machine where you make changes in the database uh, automatically. And I've been able to get that to run as fast, our new paths for Open Edge, to run as fast as classic Direct Connect, which is amazing when you think we're going through a web server and handling things that way instead of a just Direct Connect via the network. Um, our testing also proves that it's faster than all classic web adapters. Now again, this is a single test on certain machines that aren't sending a lot of data back and forth. So your mileage will vary, um, but we continue to work on uh, things to help you with performance, and I think that this is a very performant product, and again, no matter what, you will lose, use less CPU and memory. One of the old complaints we had uh, with our old app server and WebC brokers was that there was um, several tools you had to use to, uh, to control it. Um, and uh, we made it much easier. We, you can still use the Open Edge Explorer. You can still use management. It's integrated. It's, it's well designed. It works well with it. But we have one command line tool called TCMAN, which will handle all the things to control the management of not only the broker and the agent, but also of Tomcat. So you don't have to be a Tomcat expert. You don't have to go out and learn that. We've given you the tools you need. Lastly, we had complaints that we weren't able to to, uh, people weren't able to get data out of the process of the running app server to help debug things and make sure that they were running well. Um, so what we did with Paz for OE was we opened all that up. We made it all available to you. There is a built-in REST API that allows you to monitor this, not only the, the agent, but the processes and the, and the actual broker session manager. Um, and you can do some management. You can kill a, a, a session that may have gone rogue on you. Um, you can reset your metrics so you can start over again. The REST API is there. It's in the bundle. It's optional if you don't want to install it, let's say in a production environment. Um, but again, in the development tool, it's automatically installed. Also, we're using industry standards JMX, which means it can be monitored and managed using JConsole. Um, you can do that uh, right on the machine, or you can open up optional remote access. All of this leads us to the fact that since we're using industry standards, you can use third-party monitoring tools. Now, we're going to show you Nagios here in a minute. We show you Nagios because uh, we asked Tomcat what tool they recommend, and they recommended Nagios. So we're not endorsing it. We're not saying it's the best. But we are saying that this is one that works, and this is one we tested with. So this is just a quick graph. 
This is a built-in JMX memory monitor that came with Nigos. I didn't have to do anything but turn this thing on and point it at a PaaS for Open Edge broker that was running. And it'll show you on a day um, the process memory that's going up and down as garbage collection runs, the max, and so on. Uh, again, this is using the, the common JMX interface, and it's uh, a plugin that came right with Nigios. And my last slide is one showing the, the um, concurrent clients using the, the tools that are built in now with the REST API. We were able to run and get concurrent clients that run all the time. Now, using Nigios, you can also get alerts, and you can keep track of these things over a long amount of time. So, that being said, that's just a quick overview of the Pacific App Server for OpenEdge. Uh, again, I'm excited about it. I think it's a wonderful product. Uh, maybe a little biased in that regard since I've been working on it for 18 months. But I invite all of you to, to take a look at it and, uh, and give us your feedback. And that's it for me. Rob, back to you. So I just wanted to echo uh, Roy's uh, comments that you know we are very excited about uh, the Pacific App Server for OpenEdge. And uh, the people that have had a chance to look at it over the last number of months prior to us seeing it, uh, have given us some feedback. Um, I'll share just a little bit of that with you. But overall, I think you know people are very enthusiastic about what this new application server can offer them going forward. So I think most people are aware that we do an early software access program prior to most of our releases. Uh, we actually started 4.11.5, uh, an early software access program, over the summer last year. And it went on into the fall. So ultimately, we had 44 companies involved in this early software access program, 62 individuals. Um, primarily for this particular early software access program, we were focused on the specific app server for OpenEdge. That's not to say we didn't have other features that people were looking at. Certainly, that was the case. We received feedback on that. But just for today's conversation, I'll focus just briefly on some of the feedback from you know, the users. Uh, who filled out the survey at the end as far as what they felt and thought about the Pacific App Server for OpenEdge. And one of the key questions we asked is, during your testing process, were you able to take your existing OpenEdge application and modify it to make use of the new Pacific App Server for OpenEdge? And you can see here that 16% said, yes, I managed to get my entire application uh, migrated over to the new App Server. 47% uh, at least got some part of their application working with the new Pacific App Server for OpenEdge. So just over 60% had uh, success, uh, and, and this was you know prior to our general availability, so really kind of beta software. Uh, so, so we feel pretty good about the fact that uh, the te technology is working, working. We've tested rigorously here at, at Progress, and we have some validation from you, the customers, that uh, it's working and you're, and you're able to be successful. The other piece we asked was, we were curious, uh, you know, given this new technology and your experience with it, is this something you would want to start moving to, moving off of the tr traditional OpenEdge app server to the new Pacific app server for OpenEdge? Uh, and over 40% responded yes. Within uh, the first 12 months, calendar 2015, their intention was to migrate their applications over to the new Pacific app server. So again, we're excited here at Progress. We're, there's quite a lot of excitement now in the, in the uh, user community. Uh, if you haven't looked at the Pacific App Server for OpenEdge, we strongly encourage you to do so. Finally, the last topic will be uh, our training courses or educational courses that are available. Uh, our educational services team here at Progress has been working very hard to make sure that all of the courseware for OpenEdge is you know, up to date as much as possible. Uh, so you can see a list here of courses that have been recently updated to make sure that everything that's new in 11.5 is covered in the training courses. Um, you can see some additional course titles in the near future section, and by near future, probably within the next 60, 30 to 60 days, will be available as well. So uh, yeah, I, I like to remind people that we have a very extensive library of training courses. These courses are available to you as either online training or we do have instructor-led training as well. And uh, if you have a need for training for you or people on your team, I encourage you to come look at uh, what we have to offer. I've given you a link here. This is on the main progress page. You just need to get to the resources section for Open Edge, and you'll see a training section there. Um, so take a look. Uh, a lot of valuable, valuable information there, and it can really help get you up to speed on some of the newer technologies much, much more quickly and, and with more detail than perhaps just doing it on your own. 
All right. Well, that brings us to the end of uh, our remarks for today. Um, so I, at this point, we're going to be opening up to uh, Q&A, and I will hand it back to Marlis uh, to uh, kind of walk us through that. We have a lot of questions that have come through. The first question that we have come in is, what I want to know is when the Open Edge version 10.x will be retired. Okay, so that's a great question. So I'll handle it. This is Rob. I'll handle that. Um, so we have a long history of keeping alive and maintaining the last version in a series. So uh, the 9.1e release, the 10.2b release are both currently in the mature status and have been uh, longer than the even the four-year period that I talked about earlier in the life cycle policy change. Um, I would say at this point in time that uh, we do not have any plans uh, at this moment in time to formally retire the 10 to b version that you're asking about. Um, so, so like any of our versions, if you're having any kind of issues, if you have user questions about how to use features and functionality, our tech support team is great in helping you and we will continue to support you on that. Um, having said all that, um, you know, I, I opened up this discussion by reminding you that uh, you know, the new features and capabilities and, and the fixes that we put in from release to release are important to you. And if you are intent to be, there are a lot of great things that have come out in the 11.x series, so that's 11, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5, uh, that probably would help you be more competitive or you know, to, to make, you, make it a better user experience for your users. So we would always encourage you to, to, to look to see what might be uh, might, what, what might be the features that would uh, be useful to you and, and start to consider making plans to move forward. Great. Thanks, Rob. Next question. Are there any features like bi-directional replication? So in the 11.5 release, the answer is no. We did not attack uh, replication features in this particular release. Um, this might be a good time to just remind people that if you have particular enhancements you would like to see, uh, we do have on communities an ideas section. So if you can navigate to the uh, Open Edge community and you'll see an ideas button near the top. This is where we ask uh, all of you to participate uh, both in suggesting enhancements that you'd like to see and as always when you're making enhancements we would love to hear details or business cases to go with them. Uh, and it also gives you an opportunity to see what other uh, others of your peers are asking for and, the, and a chance to vote on what things you think will be important that you're seeing in the list of enhancement requests. Uh, we do regularly monitor the ideas forums and uh, you know any idea that comes in that's uh, appropriate and that's most of them, the vast majority of them, ultimately get put onto our product backlog for consideration for future releases. And, uh, you know, this is not a roadmap discussion, so we're not talking about futures, but certainly replication is something that we continue to uh, enhance over time, and, and there are certainly things we can do to make it even better than it is today going forward. Thank you, Rob. Next question, how many of the features for advanced enterprise would you have to use to justify the cost? Oh, that's a great question. <laughs> so uh, we, we've certainly done all those calculations with, with all kinds of very sophisticated spreadsheets and so on. Uh, I personally was not involved in all the details of working that, but I believe the answer is probably two. As long as you're going to make use of two of the add-ons in that uh, particular package, uh, you've probably more than uh, recouped your cost as compared to buying them all separately. Um, and I know many of you are familiar with, uh, you know, we have uh, a PSDN subscription, which bundles a lot of things in at a low price point. Uh, Microsoft does a very similar thing. It's not that you will typically use every single feature available to you in these packages, but, but as the, uh, the person asking the question is kind of getting to, there's probably a minimum subset that you probably would want to be using to make it cost effective for you. Okay, we have really been hit with so many questions, and I'm hoping we can get through them all. If we can't, we will respond to them. So I'm actually going to jump around just a little bit. So is it possible to dump data on a single tenant while database is online? So the answer is yes. So, so one of the enhancements was being able to dump by partition, um, and uh, for, for, for many, if not all, of these new capabilities, uh, we wanted to make that a, 
it's such that it's not going to impact any other partition. Uh, so essentially, it, it runs online. Yes. Okay. Is PASS a web server? It is not clear to this person. Okay, so the Pacific App Server is a combination of a web server and some other technologies. I would say, in general, the key technology is the web server, right, that we've kind of pre-configured to work in our environments. Um, Roy, I don't know if you want to add any comments to that as far as what else it provides, the Pacific App oh, Server itself. You answered it perfectly right. I mean, it has the Tomcat web server and the Java serverlet engine and an application server built in. So it's a, it all comes in the package now. You don't have to get your own web server. Um, it's ready out of the box. Okay. Thanks, Ray. Okay. Can 11.5 64-bit coexist with 102-bit, uh, 32-bit for migration? I'm sorry, Morris. I got the 64-bit part. You'll have to repeat the rest of okay, it. Okay, with 102. Oh, whoa, with 102B. Would that be right? Hmm. Maybe they just didn't put in the dot. Can 11.5 64-bit coexist with 10.2B 32-bit for migration? Hmm, that's a great question. Yeah, I'm guessing it's the clients that are 32-bit on 10.2B, and, and, and I believe the answer is yes. We've gone to great pains to make things upperly compatible. Um, but, but as Marlis mentioned, we'll be responding in more detail on some of the questions, particularly the ones we can't get to. We'll also respond to this. We, we want to just double check it with engineering to make sure we're saying the right thing here. Yeah, I, I would think that would that worked before. It was the problem when we had the same version of 32-bit and 64-bit on the machine, machine where we had the biggest problem. Okay, and you know what? I'm looking down further in the questions, and it definitely is 10. Dot to be that they're speaking about because the next question is I thought 10 dot to be uh, service pack 8 was the last service pack is that true well we do not have any additional service packs planned for the 10 to be series so yes at this moment in time it is the very last one uh, could there be a 10 to be 09 service pack we do not have one planned but of course we make these decisions based on the volume of uh, issues that get reported and the fixes that we make. Um, so I'm guessing at this moment in time it's likely there will not be another service pack for 10.2b, but I guess we always hold out the possibility as needed to put out new ones. Okay. We're going to take just a couple more questions and then everything else that we have not had a chance to go to. Uh, we will follow up uh, post-session. So is the deployment of web services or REST services much simpler with Pacific App Server, or roughly the same as with the classic App Server. I'll take that. Right. Uh, the actual deployment is about the same. Uh, the actual deployment is about the same. No, I don't think I am. Yep. yep you're Can good. you hear me now? Yep. Okay. So, so the the actual deployment of the REST uh, service is about the same. Uh, we have a tool that lets you do that in the PASOE, and uh, REST is probably the the one application that. Uh, um, would need the fewest amount of changes in your code, probably none, uh, to work. Okay, I'm going to take one last question, and again, um, oh, and a follow-up question. Did I hear Roy correctly? In order to develop using PASS and 11.5, then I must use uh, PDSOE 64-bit? Um, if you wanted to get the PASS instance, developer instance installed automatically with PAS, you need the 64-bit. If you want to use the 32-bit developer studio, you may, and then you'll have to ask for a separate Pacific App Server 64-bit for either the Windows or for another platform that's 64-bit. So no, you, you don't have to use the 64-bit. It just all comes built in in the install and makes it easier. Okay, thank you so much, Roy. Last question for, oh, and the person says thank you. The last question just for the live session, and again, we have even more questions that have come through than, than, than what we have read. Um, the question is in regard to Tomcat. If you already understand Tomcat administration, can you still use the Tomcat tools, or do you have to use the progress provided tools to manage your Tomcat server? That's, um, that's one of those questions that's yes or no. <laughs> right, we've extended a lot of the things, and um, and they will look in our instances for specific things. So, starting and stopping and managing that way um, should be using the, the the TC man tool. However, you you can still use all of the management and um, configuration of Tomcat that you used to. 
Open Edge 10 to B. Life cycle status? Question mark. Roy, Rob, who should take that one? Well, this is Rob. I, I can take that one. So, um, as we mentioned, even with our new life cycle policy, if we go to a major new release, like in this question, for this question, 11.0, the previous release will stay in the mature status so that the total duration from GA to retired is at least four years. Uh, I believe we're, we're past that at this point in time. Um, and I will say that we have no plans, or at least imminent plans, to uh, change the life cycle status of 10 to b uh, There certainly will come a point in time when we will want to move that into the retired status. Uh, but based on past history, I would guess we're, we're still a ways away from making that determination. So in the meantime, uh, 10 to b will remain in the mature status. Okay, and that is then followed by 10-1-C? 10-1-C is a little different story. So for anyone who may be on a release in the 10.x series and not yet to 10 to b uh, you, you have some choices, of course. Uh, we would always encourage you to, at a minimum, get to the last release in the 10x series, which was 10 to b uh, If you are on 10-1-C, it has been moved to the retired status. Uh, that ho happened, I believe, over the last 12 months. Uh, uh, I'll just reassure people that, you know, when we move things into the retired status, it, it doesn't mean that we're, you're out of luck and we're just going to ignore you. If you have uh, questions, issues, problems uh, using releases that have been moved into the retired status, um, our tech support team is here to help you. So you, know, you, you can be confident of that. However, obviously, if you're on an older release like 10.1c or even earlier, uh, a couple things, you're missing out on all the great new features that have been provided in the intervening years and releases uh, since then. And, uh, you know, you really should be considering, you know, what's your, your time frame and schedule to be moving forward. So, again, at a minimum, you should, uh, any 10.x user should be looking to get to 10 to b as the stopping point in the 10 series. Um, we, of course, would strongly encourage you to be looking at the 11.x series. A lot of great new features and capabilities that... Uh, can make you more effective, more competitive, and so on. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Rob. Thank you, Roy. Uh, we have one more question that has come in. Have you looked at DMZ-based deployment of Pacific? Is there a capability to split the app server and M agent pieces to comply with DMZ security needs? Uh, no, you cannot split the um, Tomcat and the Messenger. So what you would do in that case uh, to handle the DMZ is you would install a web server in the front and then have a connection to that uh, PaaS OE instance uh, behind your, your second firewall. Um, so that would be the standard. Uh, I would recommend Apache and use the AGP13 uh, network connection. Um, but yes, that's how I would recommend doing that. You would not want to run your application server or your database in the DMZ. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Roy. And that person wrote back and said, thanks so much. So uh, it looks like uh, we can wrap up today's webinar. Thanks so much, everybody. Thank you, Rob. Thank you, Roy. And again, we will be hearing from Colleen Smith in regard to today's session. Unfortunately, we did miss her with the big blizzard that has gone on here in the New England area over the last few days. So um, thanks again. Keep your eyes and ears posted for uh, seeing a an email going out and then li listening to the podcast. Excuse me, listening to the webinar again. And again, if you have any follow-up questions, be sure to go out to communities and post them there. So again, thank you, and we will see you on the next webinar.